so glad you could be with us. Hope you get a blessing out of the services this morning. Why don't you all reach down, grab a psalm book, and stand and turn with me to page 230. Page 230 in your psalm books, please. Glory to his name, down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to his name. Sing it with me, page 230. Down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where for cleansing from sin I cried. There to my heart was the blood of life. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, thanking you for this day. Dear Lord, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to serve you, Lord, to be able to call you mm-hmm. our children, uh, uh, your children. Dear Father, uh, we just we just uh, can't imagine the blessings that you have in store for us, Lord, but uh, we seek to do your will, Lord. Yes. We're here, and we hope to learn about you today a little more so that we can fall in love with you just a little more so that we'll want to serve you just a little more. We just pray now that you'll have your rule and your reign over each thing that's said and done here, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Turn on over to page 251, if you will. Page 251, near the cross. Near the cross, oh Lamb. 
Amen, amen. Good singing. Praise the Lord. Good to see everyone out this morning. And a wonderful reminder that we need to be near the cross. Thank God for the cross of Calvary and what the Lord Jesus Christ did there. Good to see everyone. Get some gentlemen to come down this morning and take up the offering. And it's a blessing to be here. It's a, just a blessing to be saved and be able to come together, gather together with God's people. And, uh, Brother Rob, you want to ask the Lord to bless the offering, please? Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for all the blessings you've given us. Yes, Lord. Thank you for your spirit, Lord. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for all the wonderful Christians that have the fellowship with you. Yes. Pray, Lord, as we uh, take up the offering, that you might give us wisdom and spend it wisely. Pray yes. that we might use it to spread the gospel far and wide. Yes. Pray, Lord, that we might be good soldiers for the Lord Jesus Christ and we might be uh, about our duties as a, as a Christian soldier, Lord. We just ask you to. Uh, heal the ones that are sick amongst us, bring the ones that are away from the cross back, and that uh, pray that we might glorify the Lord Jesus Christ this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 excerpt there and of course we understand uh, we're not supposed to judge I think we're, we're righteous and you know these people are not but we, we judge according to the word of God we say thus saith the Lord and uh, but anyways nice little read there and uh, the, oftentimes the world will quote Matthew 7 but they take out of context the Lord's not teaching not to judge there he's just telling you how to judge if you study the chapter in Matthew chapter 7 uh, but anyways, that's just a good little read. Bible memorization, Psalms chapter 23, verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What a wonderful, wonderful passage. I'd encourage you to commit, to commit that to your heart and memory. And uh, there will come a day when you'll need that passage, I promise you. And what a wonderful promise that we have. Again, we announced it at the business meeting, and I just want to make it public again. Uh, this month, we are raising funds for Brother Samuel to go on a survey trip uh, to the Philippines. Brother Samuel has surrendered his life to, be, to go overseas as the Lord opens the door. He's uh, praying and looking for the Lord's direction. And the first stop is what we would call a survey trip, and basically that's just to see where the Lord wants him, if there's some open doors. He's arranging to go with a, a veteran missionary, Brother Sutek. I believe he's been there over eight years. Is that correct, Brother? Do you know? He's been over eight years in the Philippines. He's a PBI graduate, good brother, and uh, he's got a good ministry over there. So Brother Samuel plans on going and visiting him and just see where the Lord leads. So I had mentioned uh, for a long time now, many years now, several years now, if God ever uh, laid on someone's heart from here, to go overseas to be a missionary, we would stand behind them and do everything we could to help them out. That means in prayer, in work, and financially. So now you just have an opportunity as a church family to give towards that if you would like. There's no pressure. Uh, but I tell you, it's much better spent than it is at Starbucks. Amen. 
It's much better spent than at McDonald's. So if you just cut back on a little bit of the things that we do as Americans and just you know go out and spend a lot of money here or there, if you just will put it to something of a good cause, I promise you, you won't regret it. Uh, so we'll be doing that all month. I know I just made the announcement this morning to the congregation. We did announce at the business meeting. Uh, so if you want to give to that, you have through the month of February to do so. And then uh, just a reminder about Final Fight Bible Radio. If you do not have Final Fight Bible Radio on your computer or phone, I would encourage you to download it. It is free. Just go to the Play Store, the App Store, and type in Final Fight Bible Radio. There you'll get 24 hours a day of good Christian music and good sound preaching and teaching. And it's just a variety of stuff. Again, a PBI graduate runs that and thankful for Final Fight Bible Radio. Uh, down at the bottom, again, just an article on the Judgment Seat of Christ, a continuation of that article. And one day, brother, we're all going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're all going to give an account of ourselves to him. So the Bible says, and Amos, prepare to meet thy God. Right, right. A lost world needs to prepare to meet God, thy God by getting saved. And a Christian needs to prepare to meet thy God by living a sanctified and holy life. Meet for the master's use. So I encourage you to read that and just keep in your mind and forefront about the judgment seat of Christ. Um, one other announcement that's not in the bulletin, and I appreciate everyone's willingness and just uh, I've got to come on and help out for the baby shower that was supposed to be at the end of the month. But just because of circumstances, we're going to have to cancel it. It's just not going to work out for Sean and Melissa, and uh, that's no problem whatsoever. But I do thank everyone who was willing to come out and was going to participate. And uh, that's a blessing. That's what a church family should do. Now, I, I'm speaking for them. They didn't say this. But if you want to give them a gift, I'm sure they'll take it. I would take it. So feel free if you still want to give them something to do it. But we're not going to have a baby shower here. And uh, again, I know they're just humble by us even wanting to do it. And uh, they definitely are not asking for anything. But that's what brothers and sisters of Christ are for, to be a blessing. So just keep that in prayer. And I just wanted to make that announcement. At this time, junior church can be dismissed, and Brother Richard's going to come up and sing a special one to us. Amen. Okay, so, uh, Brother Richard, can come and sing. Pastor kind of threw me there. He said, I'm going to sing a special unto you. I, said, I thought I was just going to sing to you, but it's unto you. Okay, I'm going to go home and figure that out for a while, a few days, I guess. <laughs> under the blood oh praise his dear name I'm not what I used to be my life's been changed not shackled by sin and shame it's 
already gone and had me reminding him it's under the blood. So many times I've stumbled along this earthly way. I've failed a thousand times before, for that I am ashamed. I'm sorry for the things I've done. The Lord could hear my cry, but I rejoice to hear his voice. This was his reply. Victory was given when you were born again. I washed your stained and sinful past and put new life within. No longer do you bear the marks that sin had brought your way. With happiness and peace of mind, you now can say, It's under the blood, oh praise the dear name. I'm not what I used to, my life's been changed. I'm not shackled by sin and shame, it's already I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of What I used to be, my life's been changed, not shackled by sin and shame, it's already gone, I'm happy reminding him to start to the blood, I'm happy reminding him it's under the blood. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Open your Bibles this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 9. That was a wonderful song. Perfect for the message. And the Lord definitely had Brother Richard sing that in regards to this message I'm going to preach this morning. And thank God that all of our sins are under the blood. What a blessing that is. 2 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to read this chapter. This is actually the message Brother Cisco preached on, and uh, he did a wonderful job. And uh, I, I told the gentleman when, they, when we were in preparation and delivery class, don't be afraid to preach common stories. And uh, the Bible's a deep well. As I mentioned many a times, uh, we could get five other gentlemen to come up and preach on this chapter, and they all have a little bit different slant. God would show them something a little bit differently. So I'm looking forward to preaching on this chapter. We'll read the whole chapter once you found 2 Samuel chapter 9. If you would stand for the reading of the Word of God. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. The Bible says, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Michar, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. 
Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou, sh that thou shouldst look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the, then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him. And thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread oi at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Brother Siskel, will you ask the Lord to bless the message? Yes, Lord. Lord, so good to say, Lord, that our sins are under the blood. Lord, we're changed, Lord. We're just new people in Christ, Lord. Yes, we Lord. just thank you, Lord, that Lord, that we can have a close walk with him, Lord, that we can be more like him. Father, we just love you and thank you today, Father. Thank you for each and every one here today. Father, we just here, Lord, to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that yes, you've done for us. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord. The King James Bible, Lord. That yes, Lord. All that inspired word of God, Father. We just thank you today, Father, for Pastor Reese, Lord. And we just ask that you would be with him today, Lord, as he delivers the word that you laid on his heart. Father, we just give you thanks, Lord, in advance. And, and Lord, just give you the honor and the praise and the glory. For it's in Jesus' most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I want to draw your attention to a couple of verses this morning from this chapter where we'll get the thought of the message. First of all, look if you would, back in verse 1, the Bible said, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul? Now watch it. That I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Skip down to verse 7. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan's sake, thy, uh, for Jonathan thy father's sake. All right, and one more verse, look at verse 3. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? So three times we see that David said, I want to show somebody of the house of Saul kindness. Two times we see he said, I want to show kindness for Jonathan's sake. Then we see in verse 3, he says, I want to show somebody the kindness of God. I want to preach to you this morning about the kindness of God. The kindness of God. There's no doubt as Bible believers we understand that the, the world has perverted the characteristics of God. We understand that the world constantly wants to say that God is love and God is love like he doesn't care what they do because God is love. No, we also know that God is holy. We know that God is just. But thank God we know that God is also a God of love. He's also a God of mercy. He's also a God of grace. And we also serve a God that is a God that shows kindness. And I believe what we see here in this chapter is the kindness of God revealed through David to Mephibosheth. 
And that's why I want to focus on this morning. Psalms chapter 117 verse 2 says this, For His merciful kindness is great towards us. Can't you say amen right there? Amen. His merciful kindness is great towards us. I'm thankful that we serve a merciful God that is kind towards you and me. I woke up this morning and God was kind to me. You woke up this morning and God's been kind to you because we serve a merciful God is great and his kindness is great towards us. The rest of that verse says, And the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. We should praise the Lord for his kindness. I think of the life of, uh, of um, Jonah. And Jonah's an interesting read, an interesting preach. And you study the life of Jonah. Uh, you know the story. Uh, God, uh, appeared, uh, God spoke to Jonah. And he said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. You would think, man, he's a preacher, he's a prophet. All right, Lord, I get to go to Nineveh. I get to go to cry against it. I get to go tell him, listen, God's going to destroy you in 40 days. But you know what Jonah did? He fled from the presence of the Lord unto Tarshish. You ever wonder why? Now, most of you probably already know why. Did you ever stop and think why did Jonah flee from the presence of the Lord when God called him to go cry against that great city? Well, the Bible tells you in Jonah chapter 4 why that he fled from the presence of the Lord. But just to keep you up with the story, once he fled from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa to get on a ship to go to Tarshish. We know God caused a great wind, and those sailors were uh, professional sailors. Their, their ship, they thought, was going to sink, and finally they throw him overboard. And the Bible says that God prepared a great fish that swallowed up Jonah. It was a whale, and yes, it was a fish, because God said it was. I don't care what science says. And he swallowed him. And of course, and then we see in Jonah chapter 2, Jonah's repentance there. Out of the belly of hell cried I. And of course, that whale vomits Jonah up on the shoreline. And then Jonah chapter 3, Jonah finally goes and does what God called him to do. He preached one of the greatest revivals in eight words. Eight words he speaks unto that great city. But you know what happened? The king repented. The, he made the people repent. <laughs> he made the animals repent. They had a revival like we've never seen before. And then in chapter 4, you find the reason why Jonah fled in the first place. Listen, he says in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, this is after God was merciful unto the people of Nineveh. He's, this is what he said. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. Why, Jonah? For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. You know what Jonah was saying? He's saying, I knew if I went and preached to those Ninevites that you would be merciful, that you would be gracious, that you would be kind to them. And I didn't want you to be kind to them. Now, historically, if you understand about the Ninevites, and you were a Jew, you would understand why he felt that way. The Ninevites were brutal. Uh, they would go in, Brother Rob Hickey was telling me some of the details, I don't remember all of them, but listen, they would go into cities, and they would ravish cities, they would murder people, they would take things, so much so that a lot of times people would just, you know, flee their cities before they even came in. The Ninevites were brutal, especially towards the Jews. And Jonah knew that the God he served would be kind toward them. What a thought of why Jonah would flee for the presence of the Lord. Again, I want to preach to you this morning about the kindness of God found in 2 Samuel chapter 9. The kindness of God, first of all, is seen in Mephibosheth's plight. Now, the word plight simply means his dilemma, his difficulty, or his situation. And the kindness of God was seen in Mephibosheth's plight. Even the name Mephibosheth bears witness to Mephibosheth's flight. Mephibosheth's name means a shameful thing. Well, out of the mouth of shame 
That's what the name Mephibosheth means. Now, we as Americans probably don't really understand this, but in the Old Testament, your name was associated to you. It was, had a connection, it had a meeting. You remember Abraham and Sarah? When God told them that they were going to bear a child, what did they do? She laughed. Therefore, guess what the child's name is? Isaac, which means laughter. You get to be reminded all your life that your mother laughed about the promise because your name's Isaac. But you think that one's bad. What about Esau? <laughs> you know what Esau means? Esau means red and hairy like as unto a garment. Could you imagine that baby? <laughs> you go to the hospital visit, you see that baby, and you say, boy, that's a beautiful blanket. <laughs> because he's red and hairy. <laughs> that's Esau. That's what Esau's name means, red and hairy. Mephibosheth, my name means a shameful thing. That's who I am. Just a shameful thing to my father. Just a shameful thing to my country. I'm just a shameful thing. We see the kindness of God just in Mephibosheth's name. Secondly, we see the Mephibosheth's flight and the kindness of God in Mephibosheth's condition. Look at verse 3. The Bible says in verse 3, And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God in him? Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath a, yet a son which is lame on his feet. Mephibosheth's flight shows the kindness of God because Mephibosheth was lame on both of his feet. Again, we live in America in 2020. We don't understand the burdens that someone with a disability carried back in Bible days and Bible times. They were an outcast to society. Uh, they didn't have all these homes and you know, medical uh, procedures and, and these charities that helped take care of them. No, they were just an outcast to society. And that's what Mephibosheth was, was an outcast, a shameful thing, one who was a crippled lame on both of his feet. You get a little glimpse of that in John chapter 5. You read John chapter 5, you'll study there that in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, there was a pool there. In this pool, the Bible says, there was a great multitude of impotent folk, all blind and withered. You know what they were waiting for? The moving of the water. See, every once in a while, every now and then, an angel would come down, the Bible said, and trouble the water. And those people that were blind and those impotent folks, listen to me, whoever got into the pool first was healed of whatever condition he had. I had five porches on this pool there. And could you imagine they're just waiting for this angel to trouble the water. And the, and the Bible says again, the great multitude of the blind and the crippled and those of sick of palsy are all waiting for that water to be troubled. And in that story there we read. In John chapter 5, there was a certain man that had an infirmity 38 years. And Jesus asked him a question. He said, Will thou be made whole? If you want a sense of how they treated the cripple back in those days, listen to the response. This is what the guy said. The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. He said, There's no one here when that water is troubled for me to get healed. There's no one to even put me into the pool. No one stopped by would help put him in the water. He said, I have no man to put me in the pool. He says this, but while I am coming. So put, put this in your mind's eye. This crippled man's there with a multitude of, of impotent folks. The angel troubles the water. While I'm coming, I, I imagine maybe he's crawling. Maybe he's on all fours, whatever. He's trying to get to the water. And he says, but while I'm coming, another step down before me and goes in year after year this man's trying to get healed all I'm trying to get you to see this morning is how the crippled were treated and they waited and there was no one to help them now thank God that man met Jesus Christ that day he didn't need the pool of water that was troubled by an angel because he met the great physician 
and he gets healed. But the point of the story is for you to understand and relate to those that had infirmities and those that were crippled. We see that Mephibosheth flight, his flight, his flight shows the kindness of God towards him. Again, first, his name is a shameful thing, and secondly, he was lame on his feet. I like to use my imagination and try to consider these people, and I try to put myself in their place so you understand what's going on. And I imagine Mephibosheth probably had rags for clothes. I imagine Mephibosheth was probably pretty skinny. He didn't have much food. He was a beggar by the wayside. I imagine Mephibosheth had to just ask, would someone please just bring me some water? Mephibosheth was someone of a great need. He had a plight because he was of a cripple. He was lame on both feet. I imagine Mephibosheth didn't bathe frequently. Could you imagine not being able to walk? Last thing you're worried about is washing your clothes and bathing. You're just trying to survive. Imagine he smelled pretty bad. Listen, I'm not trying to be funny. It's just the facts of life. And sometimes here at Lighthouse Baptist Church, we get to show the kindness of God unto people. And they just might come in with rags. They might just come in a little bit dirty. They might come in a little bit filthy. And listen to me, they might even stink. But do we show them the kindness of God? I remember uh, several times happening, and I think of one just recently. A gentleman came, and he's not here today. We were able to help him out, but he, uh, he brought in some clothes. He needed some place to store some things, and Wednesday night we came into church, and, man, there was just an awful smell in the church. Well, the DJ went and investigate. Well, the gentleman left a steak in a cooler with no ice. Could you imagine the smell? So, of course, we had to get rid of it. But, again, what you see is trying to paint in your mind's eye the picture of Mephibosheth's condition. Mephibosheth was just trying to survive. You know, interesting, the Bible talks about the smells and odors that would go up before God. The Bible talks about in Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings unto the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet Savior. The Lord smelled that offering that came up before him, and he said, that's a wonderful smell that's coming from Noah. I think of in Philippians chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible says, but I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable and well-pleasing to God. Paul is thanking the church at Philippi for sending him and taking care of him, and not just him, of, but worrying about other Christians. And he says that sacrifice, that offering, is a sweet smell that comes up before God. But not everything that comes up before God is a sweet smell. I read in Isaiah chapter 65, God talking about the nation of Israel. He calls them a rebellious people which walk in a way that was not good. You know how he says they smell? He said they smell as the smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all day. You ever been by a campfire and all of a sudden that wind changes and that smoke comes right in your face, about knocks you over, it burns your nose? That's what God said about the nation of Israel. A rebellious people walketh not in the way of good. You know what they said there in the text? God said they say, I am holier than thou. Mm. He said, when they said, I'm holier than thou, they're like a smoke that comes up to my nostrils. That's not well-pleasing to God. But here's the reality. In your lost condition, you're not pleasing to God. In your lost condition, before you receive Jesus Christ, and if you're here today, you've never received Jesus Christ, you don't come up as an odor that's well-pleasing. You come up as an odor that's putrefied, that is not pleasing to God, kind of like Mephibosheth smelled. One who is outside the promises of the king. One who stinks. You ever just smelled something awful? Again, I was in the medical field, and... 
Well, some of the job, obviously being a combat medic, I dealt with a lot of trauma. Got to change wounds and treat uh, uh, those Marines. I remember one time we were over in Iraq and a Marine guy hit my shrapnel and I got to pull the shrapnel out of his arm. I don't know if you know much about wounds, but if it's a deep wound, you can't just suture it. Because if you suture it, it will have a pocket inside the skin that will get infected. So you know what you got to do? You got to take some sterile gauze and you got to pack it inside that wound. Deep, open wounds and you keep packing it. Then you bandage it up, and they come to you the next day, and you know what you got to do? You got to take some tweezers, reach inside that wound, and pull that nasty, putrefied, yellow gauze out. Not only is it painful, it's enough to make you vomit. It smells awful. And you do that day after day, and slowly the wound heals from the inside out. To eventually, you can close it. If you've never smelt that before, you're not missing anything. I'm telling you, it is disgusting. I can handle blood. <laughs> I, I can handle wounds. But there's something about a smell that will make you just want to vomit. That will just make you sick. Again, and just for a moment, just think about the most rancid smell that you've ever smelled in your life. That's your sense. That's how you smell before God without Jesus Christ. There's nothing inside of you that pleases him. There's nothing good about you. You are a wretched, vile sinner that stinks in the nostrils of a holy God. And that scene in Mephibosheth, that scene in his flight. And you know what Mephibosheth needed? You know what you needed and I needed? The kindness of God. Mephibosheth needed the kindness of God. Again, we see there that he was lame on his feet. You know how he got lame on his feet? Look back at 2 Samuel chapter 4. 2 Samuel chapter 4. Look at verse 4, 2 Samuel 4, 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son had a son that was lame on his feet. He was five years old when the tiding came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. News came that Saul the king had been killed, his grandfather, News came that Jonathan had been killed, his father, and his nurse takes him up. He's five years old. She's fleeing in haste, and he falls. Either she trips or drops him, we're not told, but nevertheless, from that time at five years old, he becomes lame on his feet. That's an interesting passage there. And I'm not here to tell you what the age of accountability is, but I'm telling you there's something there. You ever hear of testimonies of kids starting to get saved around five and six? Now listen to me, age, the quote-unquote age of accountability is different for every child. There's not a magical age. It's not when one knows good or e uh, right or wrong. It's when one knows good and evil. When that child knows good and evil, that child knows that he's destined to go to a devil's hell because he's a sinner, then that child can get saved. And I've heard plenty of testimonies of people getting saved at five and six and seven. But all I'm saying here is showing you here today that he was lame on his feet because of a fall. You know why you're lame today outside of Jesus Christ? You know why you're a putrid smell outside of Jesus Christ? You too were affected by a fall. It's called the fall of man in the garden. Oftentimes people want to blame God. How could a holy God let my son get sick? How could a holy God let this evil happen? Let me just remind you, it wasn't God's fault. God put man in a garden without sin in perfect condition. Then man chose sin. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, Wherefore is by one man sin enter the world, and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. The trouble around you, the sin in your life, is because you were born in a fallen state. That scene in the life of Mephibosheth. 
Ephesians chapter 2 says this in verse 2, Where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Every single one of us walked according to the course of this world. Man, I, I tell you, it's so clear today when you, you listen to the lost world talk, you listen to them talk about politics. You see this crazy demon-possessed woman ripping up speeches at the State of the Union and all the other foolishness that's going on in this country. You know what half of them do? They're just walking toward in the course of this world. And I'm telling you, they're affected by the news media. They're affected by the TV. That's why they call it TV programs, because they're programming you how to think. They're programming you how to talk. And listen to me, it's all because... We're in a fallen world, and sinful man is falling. Mephibosheth's flight was he was lame on his feet, and Mephibosheth needed the kindness of God. Secondly, look back in our text in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Not only do we see here Mephibosheth's fl flight, we see Mephibosheth's place. 2 Samuel chapter 9, and look at verse 5. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mature, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. That's Mephibosheth's place. You know what's interesting about that? You know what Lodabar means? Lodabar means no pasture. No pasture. Oh, sure, the world has plenty of power. Oh, sure, the world has plenty of popularity. Oh, sure, the world has plenty of pleasure. But you know what the world cannot offer you today? Pasture for your soul. Rest for your soul. And what we find is Mephibosheth is from a place called Lodabar. I'm here to tell you this morning that Lodabar is a type and picture of this world. And you'll never find rest in this world. You'll never find satisfaction in this world. It's the exact opposite of a pastor. You ever think and you ever, you ever go out to Kentucky or to Tennessee or even sometimes here in Michigan and you, you go out and see a beautiful pasture? I'm just talking about green for miles. I'm talking about water where the animals come and drink. You know what you find in a pasture? There's no cars or accidents. You know what you find in a pasture? There's no people or pollution. I heard someone say, yeah, I like church. The only thing I don't like about church is the people. <laughs> that is the church. But you know where the problems come from? <laughs> the people. But in a pasture, it's all there, just rest. There's no crime or cursing. There's no fighting or fretting. There's no worries. Again, a pasture is a place of feeding. I simply want you to take away this morning Listen to me carefully. This world will never satisfy you. You'll never be satisfied with the things of this world. Oh, they'll tell you there's satisfaction at the end of the bottle, but when you get to the end of the bottle, your soul will still be left wanting. Amen. That's why you go back the next day. Oh, they'll tell you there, there's satisfaction in power, but once you reach that power, you want more power. Oh, they'll tell you there's satisfaction in money and a career. But you get that new car, you want another new one. There's no satisfaction in the things of this world. I think of John chapter 4 when the Lord Jesus Christ was talking to the woman at the well. And he asked the woman to give him a drink. And they talked there. But what I want to point out, verse 13, Jesus answered said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. You know what every single one of us has, been, that has done that we've lived any length of time? We've drank of the water from Lodabar. You know what the water at Lodabar leaves you? It leaves you wanting more. It will never satisfy. But you know what the Lord Jesus Christ told that woman at the well? But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give, he shall never thirst. I'm here to tell you, May 28, 2000, I quit drinking from the well at Lodabar, and I took a drink from the well from heaven, and my soul was satisfied that day. Amen. There's a part of me that never thirsts again. 
because I've drank and I partook of Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm here to tell you, He satisfies. He satisfies everything that you've ever wanted. But not in Lodabar. I think of Solomon, the wisest and richest man who ever lived. You know what Solomon could have? Anything he wanted. If his eyes saw it, he took it. If it's a pleasure he wanted to partake in, he did it. The Bible says he kept nothing back from his eye. There was no limitation to what Solomon could have. You know what Solomon said? All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. You'll never be satisfied. You know what the world's trying to tell you? If you just get this one thing, you'll be happy. You're just not happy because you haven't got to hear yet. And when you get to hear, you'll be happy. Newsflash, no you won't. But I can tell you how you can be happy. If you rest in Jesus Christ, if you find your purpose in him, you can be satisfied. And what we see is the kindness of God is saw in Mephibosheth's place. He came from Lodabar. By the way, Solomon, who had all that at the end of his life, you know what he said about all of his wealth, all of his pleasure, all of his kingdom, all of his gold, all of his wives? He said, vanity of vanity, saith the preacher. All is vanity. That's what this life has to offer you, vanity. But yet the scores of Christians chase the so-called American dream to never be satisfied. Lodabar will never satisfy you. Many of you heard my testimony, but at age 15, coming from a broken home, I did what most kids to do in the world in the city from a broken home. I started drinking, and by the age of 17, I was a full-fledged alcoholic. You know, you know what I was trying to do? I was trying to fill the void in my heart but I could never satisfy that void. I could never fill it. So I thought, you know what, my life was spiraling out of control. I thought, you know what, I needed a career. I needed to do something with my life. By the grace of God, I got into the military, joined the Navy. I thought, there it is, I've arrived. But I hadn't. My addictions followed me. My depression followed me. My point is, what is the point of life? Making fake IDs just to get drunk. But listen to me, that all changed May 28, 2000. My chief opened up the Bible there outside of Thessalonica, Greece. He showed me as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. He showed me for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He showed me the truth out of Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, that, listen to me, the wage of sin is not only physical death, but it's eternal damnation. And if I died without Jesus Christ, I would lift my eyes up in hell. But then he proceeded to tell me the greatest news I've ever heard. He said that Jesus Christ took my place on the cross of Calvary and he died, he was buried and rose again the third day and if I would trust in him, he would save me. Listen to me, you know what I knew for the first time in my life? That's what I've been looking for. And that day I took a drink from the well of heaven and my soul was satisfied for the first time. I was satisfied in Jesus Christ. I'm trying to tell you, I'm warning you, if you've never been born again, this world won't satisfy you. If you're here today and you are born again, this world still won't satisfy you. Why would you go back to Lodabar? Lodabar has nothing to offer. It's a place of, of vile and refuge. It's a place that stinks to God. It's a place that will never satisfy. And Again, we see the kindness of God towards Mephibosheth, not just because of his plight, but because of his place. And lastly, in conclusion, I want to show you the power of the king. The power of the king. As I already told you, many of you know, Mephibosheth was the grandson of King Saul, the king of Israel. We know that King Saul started off well, but then he turned from God and started to do his own thing. He got lifted up in pride. He, he started to do whatever he wanted to do. We know that David served him. Until Saul turned on him. And Saul, what he did is he tried to hunt down David like a dog. 
He sent his men out from David who was hiding up in a cave. And if he could have, he would have killed David. As we just read in 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, Saul and Jonathan are killed. And eventually, like the Bible said, David gets to be king. Now David's king. You know what most men would have done? They would not have cared about the dynasty of the man who tried to kill you. Most of the time in those days, they would go in and they would wipe out women and children and all the men. You know why? That way their great-great-grandson doesn't rise up and try to kill you as the king because of what you did to their father or that other dynasty. But not David. We see the power of the king. We see here that we're about to read is the kindness of God towards Mephibosheth. You ever consider the wrath of God? Brother Gary did a wonderful Sunday school this morning. Let's talk about the wrath of God. Again, a balance. We serve a God who is holy, who is love, but he's also a vengeance. You know what God did in Genesis chapter 6 and 7? His wrath was poured out on this earth. And he drowned out this whole world except for eight people. That's the wrath of God. You read about the wrath of God in Sodom and Gore, he rains down fire and burns up that city. You want to read about the wrath of God? Read about what the Bible says about hell. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. The lost men are going to experience the wrath of God. Oftentimes when I consider the wrath of God and I see these devastating fires, I stop and read the details of them. You know why? Because the world always jokes and laughs about it. Oh, me and my friends are going to be partying in the hell. Newsflash, the party's been canceled due to fire. There's no party in hell. There's torment. There's weeping. There's gnashing of teeth. One of those particular fires, I don't know if you remember, but it was a devastating fire in London. In 2017, a big apartment complex or living complex caught on fire. There was witnesses outside the building that could hear the people scream, get your kids, get your kids. As they rushed back into that building, one witness heard the scream saying, help me, help me, help my babies, help me. They said people from the 24th story were jumping out of the building to their death because that building was on fire. I don't know this gentleman, but I was reading the article. His name is George Clark. He's an actor who lived in that complex over there. He was 20, about 200 feet away from the 24th story. Again, he tells about screaming. He talks about this woman who was on the 14th floor who begged him, George, go help him get out of the fire. George, go help him get out of the fire. He told that woman, just stay there. They'll come and rescue as he started trying to get people out of that building. Fortunately, the flames moved too fast. By his own testimony, he said, I know she never made it out of the fire because help never came. I don't exactly know how many people have lost their life, but if you go back and look, it's just a devastating fire. I think what was remarkable about the whole thing, and here's what I want you to take away. There was a counselor, probably a city counselor. His name was Robert Atkins. He said, people are traumatized, devastated, and confused. He said this, listen, Christian. He says, the residents told me there was no fire alarm in that building. There was no alarm. There was no warning. There was no way to tell them to get out. People were in their bedroom asleep as they burned. Christian, did you hear me? There was no alarm. There was no warning. There was no one telling them to get out. You know what your job is? Your job is to show this lost world the kindness of God. They might not understand it to be the kindness of God, but you're telling them how to escape the fire. You need to tell them Jesus Christ is your only hope. Amen. You need to lift up your voice like a trumpet. Again, we see the kindness of God towards Mephibosheth. Back in verse 3, it said, The king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God in him? Ziba said unto him, Unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son, which is lame on his feet. Again, we see he wants to show them the kindness of God. I know most of you, probably some of you can quote this, but I want you to turn to Titus chapter 3. And again, we see the kindness of God towards Mephibosheth. Because David 
calls from Mephibosheth. Thank God for the kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ towards us. Thank God for the cross of Calvary. Look at Titus chapter 3. Verse 3, the Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, dis deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Isn't that true for you? You fall somewhere in that category. If you don't fall in that category, I've got a few other categories you'll fall in. But well, that's you. That's the Bible summarizing you without Jesus Christ. But look at the rest of the, keep reading. Watch it in verse 4. But after that, mm, the kindness and love of God our Savior towards man appeared. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You know what appeared while you were a yet a sinner? The kindness of God appeared to all men in the man Christ Jesus. The Bible says that he tasted death for every man. And the kindness of God was demonstrated in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the kindness of God. I'm thankful for the mercy and grace of God that He's holy and long-suffering and loving. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded His love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oftentimes, I don't just focus on salvation, but this message is very pointed to salvation. Listen, if you're here today, there's nothing you could do in your flesh to please God. You are unclean. You are undone. You are like Mephibosheth. You're lame on both of your feet. You are from a world called Lodabar that stinks before the nostrils of God. And the only thing, your only hope is the kindness of God found in Jesus Christ. But if you accept Jesus Christ, you'll find the kindness of God. The kindness of God is in him. If you would turn back to your passage, I'm almost done. I want to show you why Mephibosheth was showed kindness. Why Mephibosheth was showed kindness. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 9. We know that Mephibosheth was showed kindness. He gets called to the presence and palace of the king. But I don't want you to miss this because this is good. Why was Mephibosheth showed kindness and mercy? Again, look at verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? David said, Listen, I love Jonathan like a brother. And I want to show somebody the kindness of God for Jonathan's sake. I want to show somebody kindness for Jonathan's sake. You know why you get experienced the kindness of God? Look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we're about done. I want you to read it. This is why you get experienced the kindness of God. Your Bible's written in such a way that when it paints a picture, it uses the words so you connect the dots and you see the emphasis of the story. Again, Mephibosheth was shown kindness for Jonathan's sake. Ephesians chapter 4, look at what it says in verse 32. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know what you have there? One of the most beautiful pictures of the kindness of God 
showed towards sinful man in the life of Mephibosheth when David said, I want to show somebody kindness for Jonathan's sake. I'm telling you, the reason you get the kindness of God is not because you're good. It's not because you're great. It's because Jesus Christ is good and Jesus Christ is great. And God wanted to show mankind kindness for Christ's sake and what Christ did. I hope in conclusion you understand clearly the only reason you have salvation, the only reason you have forgiveness of sins, the only reason you have exceeding and precious promises, the only reason you have victory over death in the grave, the only reason that you have that blessed hope that's coming one day. Listen to me, the only reason you're going to get a new body and become victorious is for Christ's sake and thank God for Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And if you want anything from God, you got to get in Christ. And he'll show you kindness for Christ's sake. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Brother Val, if you come and play. I'm thankful for the kindness of God for Christ's sake. As Brother Val begins to play, the altar's open. Maybe you simply want to tell the Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord for pulling me out of Lodabar. Uh, thank you, Lord, for saving my old wretched soul. Thank you for saving my wife. Thank you for saving my children. Lord, thank you for showing me kindness for Christ's sake. Maybe you're in here today. You say, preacher, I don't really know what you're talking about. I've never been born again. I've never been saved. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Listen, we're not into the high-pressure salesman. But I'm telling you, don't leave this church building without getting born again, without being saved. Jesus Christ died for you. He'll save you. God will save you for Christ's sake. For what he did on the cross of Calvary. My friend, salvation... It's complete in Jesus Christ. I'm glad that salvation's not hard. If you will realize who you are, a sinner, you're like Mephibosheth. You've been affected by a fall. You stink. You can't please God. You have nothing to offer him. If you'll realize because of that, you deserve hell. But you believe that Jesus Christ took your place on the cross of Calvary. You believe that he's God and he died in your stead. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. If you will receive Jesus Christ by putting your faith in him and him alone, he'll save you. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. May 28, 2000, I fell to my knees. I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm going to die and go to hell. But I believe you died for me. The Lord saved me. That day I put all my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that finished work. And that day, for Christ's sake, he saved my soul. Thank God for the Lord Jesus Christ. You have just another minute and we're going to close out in prayer. Brother Jason, will you ask the Lord to dismiss us and bless the food, please, brother? Yes, sir. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, sir. Yes, 
Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord. Amen, amen, you are dismissed.